Welcome everyone. Good afternoon. It's good to see you all again for another session of Awesome Ideas in Judaism. Just a quick reminder about the, uh, the format of these sessions. Uh, we're going to begin with defining the idea as presented in Rabbi Arthur Green's uh, book, Judaism's 10 Best Ideas. We're following his layout for some of the, uh, the most important ideas, um, kind of holding up and defining uh, a lot of other aspects of Judaism that we may, we may know on a super, on a superficial level, but we're really getting down to kind of what's underneath the hood of some of them. Um, we'll explain and expand on some of the ideas and the sources that Rabbi Green brings. And in fact, I realized as uh, I went about putting together this session that um, I think this is the mo the one so far where I've kind of diverged the most from what Rabbi Green talks about in his book in terms of bringing other materials not actually present in the book. Um, so that's that's okay. I mean, it's, uh, but if you, if you prepared stuff in there, you're going to get something uh, a, a bit different as well, but we will also connect to what Rabbi Green talks about. And then at the end, we'll try to connect to how does this idea connect into Jewish life and practice as we know it. Um, I think you'll find, uh, like last week, a lot of different ways that this connects, and I'm curious about your perspectives, how this idea has factored into your construction of your Jewish life, your Jewish practice, your Jewish behavior, um, how you see tikkun olam maybe animating that or um, giving your Jewish practice meaning, something along those lines. Okay, any questions or anything like that before we get started? Great. We'll dive right in. So the term this week is tikkun olam. And I suspect, depending on your level of um, kind of familiarity or enfranchisement or something like that with, um, Juda with American Judaism, this one probably, you know, may, may well strike you as familiar. I know for me, growing up in a reform synagogue, um, this was a term that was used, you know, pretty much all the time for a lot of different things. Um, we'll get to that definition as it, sort of tikkun olam as it's used today in the, in the American Jewish world a little bit later on. But I actually want to begin with a bit more diving in a bit more to the history of the term tikkun olam, which Rabbi Green touches on in his chapter, but doesn't go too deep. Um, he's writing a short chapter that's in service of sort of a larger purpose. Uh, we have a bit of time here to go to go a little bit deeper. So. Looking at the term, you can see I, I've sort of made a little chart for you up on the, uh, on the screen share. This word here, tikkun, is generally translated something like uh, the, the root in here, a tav, a kuf, and a nun. Generally translated something like fixing or repairing. Um, it can also mean something like establishing, as in like establishing something for the first time or, or setting something, st stabilizing something. Uh, the term takes on more specific meanings, basically depending on its particular context. The other piece of, of the term olam generally gets translated as, as world, um, you know, in, in both modern Hebrew, uh, in, in, the, in the prayer book, it generally translated as, as world. However, it can also have this meaning, especially in old, biblical and other ancient texts, have this meaning of like eternity or forever. If you think about prayers from the Siddur, the term le'olam probably strikes, strikes you as familiar, would translate as something like for eternity, as in like forever, right? Um, even when, and you know, to make the defining the term tikkun olam even a bit more challenging, even when it refers to the world in the sense that, well, we would use the term English world, which world is that? You know, there, there's uh, the physical world around us. There's the world in the sense of the societal, the societal order of things. Um, you know, there, there's, the, there's the world, as we'll get to, in the sense of a, a fully realized divine manifestation in the world. There's a lot of different possibilities about what exactly that could mean. But this is sort of the starting place for thinking about uh, the, the term tikkun olam at kind of a literal level. It literally means fixing or repairing the world, but the fixing is unclear or the repairing is not totally clear what that means and the world is not clear, totally clear what that means. There are 
basically four primary definitions of tikkun olam that have been present in Jewish history. And this term goes way back. Um, and I'll share, uh, towards the end, I can share a link with you. I'll also share it in the, the description of the YouTube video, um, a link to an article by Rabbi Jill Jacobs, who is the executive director of the rabbinic human rights organization, Trua, who wrote a really excellent piece, relatively short. I think it's, I would rate it as moderately accessible in terms of its use of you know, Hebrew vocab and references to things. It'll make a lot more sense to you if you want to go and read it after listening to what I have to say, because I'm uh, largely informed by what Rabbi Jacobs brings. But Rabbi Jacobs goes through basically four primary definitions, what tikkun olam has meant at different stages in Jewish history. So the first stage, uh, the, the first meaning of tikkun olam as, as we found it, um, you might find familiar from services, the, the Alenu prayer, which uh, was originally a piece of the Rosh Hashanah liturgy, um, it was evidently so popular and, and spoke to people in such a profound way that it became part of every service. So in fact, three service, all three services every day uh, are concluded with um, Alenu followed by uh, Mourner's Kaddish. Um, I've excerpted it significantly here because it's it's rather long but if you're if you're familiar with with uh traditional jewish prayer you'll recognize this line the first part begins and that first section refers to the greatness of god and of the particular relationship between god and the jewish people you get into the second section second section which begins uh, the way the way it's sometimes sung at uh, at Beit Am. I'm not going to sing the whole thing for you, but the second section gets into this promise of divine sovereignty that will eventually encompass the entire world. So just these first couple of lines, the way they're translated, um, and this is coming from. Uh, hmm, uh, this is coming from the, the Sim Shalom translation of, uh, of this prayer. Um, we hope in you, Adonai our God, soon to see your splendor, that you will sweep idolatry away so that false gods will be utterly destroyed and that you will perfect the world by your sovereignty so that all humanity will invoke your name and all the world's wicked will return to you repentant. So uh, I know I saw what you're saying, what you saw said in the chat, Amy, about Deb and Stephanie. Um, I don't see anyone in the waiting room here. so um they may we may need to send them the uh the link or something to that effect for them to join in um so that second section uh to our contemporary ears you know can sound you know really i would say grating um there's you know this seems like a rejection of others religious others religions that seems you know almost perhaps intolerant maybe even something like proselytizing not to apologize for it completely and it, and in many communities um they work around this section either by not saying it out loud or in some uh, some cedarim some prayer books like um the reconstructionist colon shema sidur or the reform mishkan tefillah sidur um they change or edit this this paragraph to better reflect their their views but for what it's worth the inspiration for this uh for this paragraph isn't the repeated injunction you find in in Bible to wipe out idolatry. But it's actually this paragraph, and I brought it here in source number three from, from Isaiah, the idea that at some point in the future, God will bring all the other nations to God's holy mountain, in other words, the temple to, to the center of, of worship of God, and there let them rejoice. Uh, their sacrifices and bird offerings will be welcome um, on that altar just as ours are. And my house, uh, my house shall be called the house of prayer for all peoples. You often see that written above the Aron Kodesh and synagogues here and there. So it's this idea of, of a more, uh, a more universalizing approach to religion. The idea is eventually everyone in the world will get it and understand that the God of Israel is the true God and, and um, uh, you know, join with us in worshiping God. But the key, the key piece for our purposes here is this line, you will perfect the world by your sovereignty. It's, I bolded it here, litakein olam, 
same same roots, same idea. So so to perfect uh, is how they translate here. It's this idea of of anticipation of a divine kingdom to come, basically. Um, that's one of the one of the basic senses that we we've seen tikkun olam uh, deployed uh, in in Jewish history and in Jewish text so far. Questions about this idea? I, there's I'm going to go through several of these. Uh, there's there's four of them total, so I want to pause after after each one. Questions about this idea of tikkun olam as as um, perfecting the world in the sense of of religious unification uh, under under God's sovereignty. That kind of makes sense. Any questions? Okay. The second deployment of tikkun olam that we see in, in Jewish texts is uh, from the midrash, where it's a it's used as a basically a call to preserve the physical world. That's how Rabbi Jacobs puts it. Um, and it refers to you know the tikkun olam. It, it's it's repair. It's more like the it's more like that other um, sense of of like establishment, the sense of stabilization of the world, in a in a literal physical sense, like literally holding the physical world together. We get an example of this with a, a midrash on uh, the creation story. So source number four here quotes from the book of Genesis, the very beginning, and. Um, it's, it's the verse where God says, let there be an expanse in the midst of the water that it may separate water from water. So God made the expanse and it separated the water which was below the expanse from the water which was above the expanse. This is one of my favorite bits in the sort of biblical idea of how the world was organized. There's water down below and there's water up above. Why is the sky blue? Because there's water up there, obviously. That's how the ancients understood the world to be organized. And it was so, God called the expanse sky, there was evening, there was morning, a second day. So there's something missing here, which you might expect, and it's what prompts the rabbis to write a midrash on it. Any thoughts about what might be missing here that we would expect? You get a, you get a thousand bonus points if you, uh, if you can identify what's missing. So after after God created all the other uh, on all the other days the other pieces of creation, God saw what 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 was created and called it good. Good, very nice. Thank you, Susan. Here, there's what. <laughs> well done. Here, God doesn't call this good, and the rabbis are obviously, you know, trying to figure out why. How could that be? How could this not be called good? So there's a midrash. This is from Bereshit Rabbah, which is a collection of rabbinic midrash on the book of Bereshit, which is Genesis. And here we find Rabbi Chlinin said, because on that day, and they're, they're sort of answering the question implicitly, why is, why is it not called good? Rabbi Chlinin says, because on that day, a schism, a machloket, was created. As it is written, that it separates water from water. Rabbi Tavyomi says, if because of a if because of a division made litaken olam and here it literally says litikno shel olam, uh, but it's that same idea that for something to do with with repairing or or establishing the world. If because of a division made litaken olam, and to stabilize it, if they it, it was good was not written in connection with that day, how much more so should this apply to a schism that leads to the confusion of the world? So. We're less interested here in exactly, you know, the, the solution to the Midrash. What we're interested in is how Rabbi Tavyomi uses Litaken Olam. Here he's using it literally, God, God separated the water from the water in order to create and stabilize the physical structure of the universe, right? So we're, this has nothing to do with human action. This has nothing to do with, you know, divine sovereignty later on. This is literally an establishment of the world. So this is another way that the phrase tikkun olam uh, has been deployed in the past. I would say, you know, percentage-wise, this is there's the least use this way, but it's still a, a um, an important note that, that you know that um, tikkun olam has almost an environmental um, uh, sort of sustainability, like literal sustainability aspect to it as well. Okay. Two ideas so far, tikkun olam is divine sovereignty in a, in a world that is coming. 
uh, tikkun olam as physical stabilization of the world. Questions so far? How are we doing? Bearing with me? Okay. A third use of tikkun olam. So now we're, we're a little bit later in the, the, the literary history of Judaism, to the era of the Mishnah. And here, the rabbis use tikkun olam to mean something along the lines of sustaining of the social order. So the word tikkun olam appears about 10 times in the Mishnah, and mostly, of all places, in relation to problems in traditional divorce law. So the rabbis spend a lot of time worrying and trying to make sure that there's no confusion about who is and isn't married. And the reason they do that is to avoid a, a, a status called, a personal status called mamzerut. We would call it something like being a bastard or some, you know, a, 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 an illegitimate status that a child could have as a result of illeg illegitimacy or illicitness in their parents' union. So the rabbi, you know, so any child born out of wedlock would be a mamzer, or any child born as a result of infidelity within a marriage would be a mamzer. That would be a, a significant burden on them. They wouldn't be able to marry within the Jewish people. Um, it, it would be a big burden. They, they want to avoid that status, if at all possible. So they spend a lot of trying, time trying to make sure that no one who thinks they're not married is actually married. So they want to make sure that everyone knows exactly what their marriage status is. And so we get examples like this one from the Mishnah, where basically the way divorce is affected in Jewish ritual law, the, the husband sends the wife what's called a getz, which is a divorce document. It can't go the other way, which is a big problem. And I want to, na I want to name that. There's no mutuality in this. It would only be uh, in this traditional formulation, sent by the husband to uh, their wife. Um, and this would be a divorce document officially dissolving the marriage. But what a husband could, could potentially do is uh, send, you know, formulate a get, send it to his wife intending to divorce her, and then change his mind. Now, theoretically, and totally legally, a, a get uh, um, put together and witnessed and signed in front of a Beit Din, that's a, a, a Jewish religious court, could be undone by that religious court. So a husband, as it says, originally a husband would bring a, together a court wherever he was and annul the gets. In other words, I live in town A, my wife lives in town B. Uh, I send her the get that I've prepared here in town A. And then having second thoughts while that get is, is en route, uh, me and my date dean in here dissolve it. What's the problem? My wife in town B would receive it, think it's still legitimate, um, understand herself to no longer be married, and then go and remarry someone else. The kids of that union would then be mamzerim and we have a big problem. So even though that's entirely legal, the, the rabbis outlaw that practice. Once a get has been signed and witnessed and, and sent, it can't be undone even by a court. So Rabban Gamliel established that this should not be done. Why? As it says, mifne tikkun olam, because of, tik, or I'm sorry, tikkun ha'olam, because of tikkun ha'olam. There's another example here in the same Mishnah. The husband could change his name or his wife's name or the, the name of his town or his wife's, wife's town. Basically say, say uh, the get was delivered to my wife, but I had had second thoughts on the way. I could say, oh, that get was written in such a way that wasn't specific enough to me. You know, I, I actually use a totally different name. Um, you know, so, you know, and try to, try to wriggle out of the get in that way. That's also prohibited by Rab Rabban Gamaliel, even though technically true, you know, get, uh, documents do need to be, need to be precise. So Rabban Gamaliel established that we, what we do when we write these gets is, you know, the man, so-and-so, whatever his name is, and any name that he has, basically per preventing me from wriggling out uh, of the Beit Din. Why? Again, mipne tikkun olam. So basically, in the rabbinic context here in the Mishnah, mipne tikkun olam translates to something like, uh, for the sake of the preservation of the system as a whole. 
you know, if we if we had this possibility of writing legal documents and then uh, basically ignoring them, you know, get, getting out from under their con their consequences, the system falls apart, right? No one can ever be sure of their status. So, and even though it would technically be legal within our structure, we, we forbid that practice because it would be a, a detriment to the system and disrupt the system as a whole. Okay, we're getting far away from sort of the practical implications here. If you have questions about divorce law and things like that, I'm happy to address that, you know, maybe outside the scope of this class. But are there questions here about how this, how tikkun olam is deployed as a term uh, here? We're good? Okay, well done. Does this diagram look familiar to anyone? Anyone tell me what the what this diagram is? It's okay. It's okay if it's brand new to you. It's my my pleasure to get to uh, to teach it. Uh, Sephiro. Ah, Kaylee, very nice. So this is a diagram of what's called the Sephirot, and this is where we get the fourth and potentially the most uh, the most familiar uh, deployment of the term Tikkun Olam. So this comes from the system of of Jewish mysticism called Kabbalah. It's specifically the uh, era of Kabbalah called Lurianic Kabbalah. So I'm not going to go too much into where the history of Lurianic Kabbalah, but the big idea that comes out of, of Lurianic Kabbalah has to do with how the world was created. And a couple of big concepts that really caught on much more broadly. Uh, the first is what's called Tzimtzum. So basically the idea within Lurianic Kabbalah is that God, in order to create the world, had to somehow contract God's self, somehow contract the divine self, in order to make room in the cosmos for the world to be created. Basically, if, if the world was created within the godly part of the cosmos, there wouldn't be any space for it. You know, it would just be another aspect of God. And so God contracted God's self just enough to make room to create the world by this process of Tzim Tzu. God then emanated God's self into that, that space, into the world, by means of these 10 spherot. And if you add them up, there's 10 here. And the idea is basically that these are each aspects of the divine presence. And divine emanation begins at the top and flows through each of these. I had a teacher explain to me uh, once, like imagine sort of a uh, water pouring into a system of, of glass vessels at the top and the water flowing from each to each and the, the vessels are colored differently and each, you know, sort of uh, make the water appear differently. But that water flowing from top to bottom refer that represents the, the emanation of divine, uh, divine presence, divine energy. And by flowing through these sephirot, um, it comes out the bottom as the creation of the world. There's way more to go into here. <laughs> the, but in order to understand uh, what tikkun olam means, you need to understand how this works because the idea was basically that God contained these sephirot within a series of vessels. And some of those vessels proved to be too weak to hold the more powerful uh, of the sephirot, and those vessels shattered. What resulted was, as, you know, as both the, the divine emanation and the shards of those vessels made their way into the created world, we ended up with a world with this mix of both divine lights and what are called klipot, these shards or fragments, the shells of, of the vessels. And this is basically the, the introduction of evil into the world, because now we have a world that's not just created through divine emanation, but also has some other non-divine non stuff in it. Okay, so the idea within Lurianic Kabbalah is that we can free the divine emanation that's, that's concealed within each of these klipot in our universe, basically through the performance of mitzvot. We can, by doing mitzvot, both, both interpersonal ones and ritual ones, discover and lift up some of those sparks of divine energy and return them to their source. 
what that'll result in is a, is a tikkun of the olam, right? A, a repair of the world by returning all those divine sparks from their, their, uh, their sort of hiding places to their source. We can then affect, uh, actually, you know, through our actions, we can basically affect God and we can affect the universe and bring about its, its, uh, its reconstruction and repair. So the brilliance of the Lurianic model of tikkun is, I think, the suggestion that, that human behavior can have an effect, either positive or negative, on the world as a whole. And mitzvot, both the ethical and ritual, uh, have an impact even beyond the immediate effect of the action. So when you light Shabbat candles, for example, you're not just performing a mitzvot, you're actually locating and lifting up a, a particular spark. At the same time, the emphasis on realizing divine perfection, rather than actually, actually on improving the condition of humanity, kind of complicates the application of the mystical concept of tikkun for us in Jewish practice. Um, and how, as we'll see it applied to basically social justice work. Uh, you know, in theory, a, what, one mitzvah like the mitzvah of tzedakah, giving charity, is one way to lift up a spark. When you give tzedakah, you lift up a spark, right? However, within this model, the idea isn't, the focus isn't on affecting repair of the world um, by improving the, you know, by lifting up the person who's the recipient of tzedakah. It's repairing the world through lifting up the spark as a result of that mitzvah. It's actually like the focus is not on improving the human condition. It's more upon, more on this divine, you know, recon, uh, this divine perfection. Okay, that was a lot. Does that kind of make sense? What questions do you have about uh, particularly this one, the Lurianic belief in, in Tikkun Olam as, as uh, repair of those shattered vessels or about any of these so far, the way Tikkun Olam has been deployed uh, in Jewish sources previously? Deb, you have your hand up. You can, uh, you can take yourself off of mute and ask your question if you like. Thank you. Uh, what about thoughts? Because I read the chapter and it said, as long as the deed is done, but if you're thinking, gosh, I really wish I didn't need to do this, does that count as a half repair or does it make a difference? Oh, so I see what you, So with regard to, you know, in doing mitzvot for the purposes mm -hmm. of, of affecting this tikkun, yeah, yeah, I think Rabbi Green touches on this, right? Like it's ultimately the deed that matters. Right. right? And not necessarily the intention. Right, like you could you could do tzedakah, you know, grudgingly or you know because you know someone compels you to, and that. But are we not enjoined to try to think good thoughts in alignment with all of this? Right. So, so the rabbis do put a lot of um, a lot of stock in the importance of kavanah, the intention that we we bring to doing mitzvot, and that's certainly. Um, a factor here. I mean, this is sort of taking us away from the idea of tikkun olam a little bit, but oh. Rabbi Green does does touch on this point, so it's worth addressing. Um, within Judaism, ultimately, you know, the, if we could only have one or an, one or the other, either righteous action or righteous intention, we're much more concerned with the action. Thank you. I mean, that's that's you know that's ultimately the bottom line. Ideally, you want both, <laughs> right? But yeah, that, that's essentially the, uh, the essence. Thanks, Dan. Stephanie. Um, so the little sparks of whatever are basically what came out of the shattered vessels? Yes. And they pulled down? So, they, so what was in the vessels was yeah. divine emanation. And if you're looking for a more detailed explanation of what divine emanation, I cannot give it to you. Oh, it's, liter no, it's literally Ein Sof. It's, it's like ultimate supernal, you know, power and force. It's okay. beyond, beyond the possible possibility of description. You basically imagine, you know, the, uh, you know, it, it, it's somehow like superheated when it's, when it's with God. And as it's, as it's sent out through this series of, of Sefirot, they serve to cool it to the point where it can then turn into physical reality and we can, we can interface with it, if that kind of makes sense. Like this is almost like a cooling system for, 
for super hot divine emanation as it flows from top to bottom. Okay. Uh, yeah. So at some point, those vessels that that contain these sephirot weren't structurally sound enough to to contain them, and they shattered as a result of the power inside of them. Okay. And so all of them eventually shattered. That's a good question. It's awfully specific. I'm not sure it totally matters for our purposes here, and I okay, don't know well, the answer. I'd have to go look that up, whether, whether it's a total shattering or only a partial. I think regardless, the fact that there was, you know, sort of shattering at all, those, those clepo, the shards got kind of mixed in with the flow and got flushed out the bottom of the system okay. and into, into the created world, which is why we, we're contending with them now. Okay. We could do a whole other course on this. I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. Of course, of course. Any other questions? Okay. So to sort of sum up uh, the idea of Tikkun Olam as it's been, been presented so far, and here's where I really, I really agree with Rabbi Green. There's, there's real beauty in this idea of Tikkun Olam, especially this fourth one. Uh, the, the mystical one, which is the one I think Rabbi Green leans on the most heavily. Because it involves this recognition that we live in a broken world. There's something about the world that is broken and not the way it ought to be. And, you know, that's, as Rabbi Green points out, that's most easily manifested in what we would call the political realm, right? There's, there's injustices done to people of all kinds through the means of political power, right? Um, there's poverty and hunger and oppression of all kinds. It's, it's easily manifest there, but the brokenness really goes even deeper than that. You know, as Rabbi Green says, it's a brokenness where, where in which we've, we've forgotten what it means to live in God's world even, to celebrate the sacredness of life itself. You know, we're, we're alienated. Rabbi Green brings up the, the story of the exile from the Garden of Eden as kind of the, the archetypical example of this this exile, this, um, this sort of brokenness of the very human condition. Rabbi Green sees it as a, a myth about alienation, you know, the, the way that the first human ancestors were uh, exiled from that, that primordial place of absolute goodness, right? Rabbi Green sees it as about alienation, that, about the distance between ourselves and God, but also in some ways the distance between us and our truest selves, the, the, the selves that we, we at one time were, or the, the selves that we in some sense ought to be. We go about using our knowledge, you know, acquired as a result of, of that incident with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We go about using our knowledge for our, our own ends. And, and because we're serving ourselves, basically, as we go about using our knowledge to manipulate the world around us, we make that natural, the natural world into some kind of an other, some kind of object for us to manipulate and use and, and conquer and subjugate. When the reality is, the created world, as you know, demonstrated here through you know, the, this idea of the Sefi wrote, is an extension of, it's an emanation of God. It's all, it's all in some sense one, you know, just as we are part of the created world as well. We're in some sense one with the whole world around us and one with, one with God. That's, a, that's an idea we'll get to in the very last of these sessions. So for one thing, as Rabbi Green points out, this is a, a basis for environmental concern in Tikkun Olam as well. But it's, um, you know, it, it speaks to the sort of potency of this idea as something that can not only motivate behavior, but infuse behavior with meaning. You know, we're, we're working towards something much bigger, a, a a somehow reunification, a resetting of the, the system into a way that really it ought to have been in the first place. Okay. So here's where I want to make this, the transition into talking about tikkun olam as it's, as it's manifested in Jewish life and practice today. I'm going to, I'm going to keep the Sefi wrote drawing up here because it's nice, it's nice to look at. <laughs> so, as I mentioned, there's, well, I guess I, I haven't totally mentioned, Rabbi Green touched on it a little bit, but basically Tikkun Olam has turned into something of a buzzword in American Judaism. 
um, to the point where there's real conflation between Tikkun Olam as it's been deployed in these, these different but related senses through uh, Jewish history. Conflation of Tikkun Olam in that sense with basically liberal politics, social justice, something like that. You know, I remember growing up, um, basically hearing, hearing about, you know, how important it was to go do the mitzvah of Tikkun Olam. Now, I didn't know what that meant back then exactly, other than that we ought to go out and, you know, do the right thing and go out to go out and help people. But I realize now that that's actually, that doesn't make any sense within Jewish context. Tikkun Olam is not a mitzvah. None of these texts that we brought use Tikkun Olam in, uh, in the Tanakh, right? It's not a myth. It's totally a post-biblical term. It's very much an idea. It's a, it's a, it's a concept that developed separately from the concept of mitzvah, right? But it's the kind of thing where, you know, growing up in a reform synagogue, that's the way people talk, um, you know, as if that's the, you know, almost the essence of Judaism somehow is to do this work of tikkun olam. And, you know, it's been, you know, wh whereas the term went mostly unused in between about the 16th century when, when Kabbalists were formulating ideas like this one, and about 1950 or so, um, the concept since reemerged as almost a shorthand for, for social justice. In about the 70s, 1970s, 1980s, um, the progressive Jewish world began to emerge as an entity separate from so-called mainstream uh, organizational Judaism. And Tikkun Olam became something of a rallying cry for them. Uh, there's a magazine, a, a kind of leftist magazine called Tikkun that contributed to this. Um, the idea being you know, all of this work that we do in the world to, to heal it and to, to put it right is in some sense a, an act of repair on the world. The thing is, it became so broadly applied, this term tikkun olam, that it, be, it came to refer to anything from a direct service project, you know, working in a soup kitchen or a shelter or something like that, to political action, you know, going to lobby or, or writing letters to your Congress people. It can be can be labeled tikkun olam to philanthropy. All those can be labeled tikkun olam, even though they're very different actions. Um, and like I said, this has come to be treated by some as as essentially the essence of Judaism. That it's all about this kind of uh, this kind of social justice work. And I feel like a lot of folks that this has an unfortunate side effect of basically collapsing everything else that Judaism has to offer from the ritual to spirituality, kind of collapsing it together as, as non-essential. You know, as, as Rabbi Hillel would say, the rest is commentary, right? It sort of pigeonholes the rest of that as commentary and makes this the, the absolute uh, singular focus. And while I you know, want to validate that it's very important, it's in fact crucial to what we do as Jews, Judaism is so much more. And so that's why I think this term, tikkun olam, um, ought to be a, deployed a little bit more carefully. I'm curious, before I go further and, and start, you know, tell you what I think a little bit about how we maybe ought to deploy and define tikkun olam a little bit better. Is this something anyone has experience with uh, from growing up? Sort of what's your, what's your understanding of tikkun olam um, coming into this afternoon? You know, have you seen it deployed before or has it been part of your um, your, your self-understanding of your actions um, up to this point so far. Anybody? Hi. Um, oh, Kaylee, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I have heard it um, mostly in the way you were talking about it in <laughs> relation to social justice, because that is a lot of my like social circle. Is people involved in that and um, um, yeah and it kind of has shaped a little bit like I don't know kind of my my goals in the world is yeah. the helping of others the sure. um, trying to make the world better for us all mm -hmm. would you say would you say you know sort of putting that within the framework of tikkun olam was you know, sort of formational or something like that for you? I do think it's at least a part of it. I think it at least ties together with, mm -hmm. and, and it's like, because that, the emphasis of it, 
from a lot of Jewish people that I know is like a lot of what has drawn me to Judaism. Oh, good. Actually, I, I want to I want to flag that is really really important, and that's one you know one of the really powerful, um, important, useful uh, things about Tikkun about this idea is the way it you know the way it really draws people in. I'll, we'll talk more about that. Thank you, Kaylee. Yeah. Me notes that has, she has a similar understanding to mine. I think um, I'm, I'm curious about, you know, I, I imagine folks who've been in Corvallis for a long time, you know, because there's not, uh, you know, our, our approach here is pluralistic. Um, you know, I, I suspect that, you know, my, my experience was colored by growing up in a specifically reformed shul. Um, you know, maybe this isn't, this isn't such a common experience here in Corvallis as it might be in other, uh, other parts of the Jewish world. So, oh, please, Stephanie, go ahead. Um, I was curious then, is, uh, is the more orthodox mm. side of Judaism not pay attention to the kind of reforms, etc., that are uh, the practices of, of, of sure. what, what you were outlining with, with reform? Yeah. Um, generally speaking, yes. So, um, I think you're asking not so much about what, what the difference is between reform and orthodoxy, but in terms of how they relate to this concept of tikkun olam. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, in my experience, yes, they, they, they don't think of, think of the work that they do in, in the world in terms, in terms of social justice as falling under a tikkun olam framework. Um, I think part of the reason is in, in general, the, um, you know, the liberal streams of Judaism are not only, you know, we call them liberal, um, you know, as opposed to, to orthodoxy, but they are politically liberal as well, predominantly. And so I think there's been a kind of a, you know, way that these kind of things go hand in hand, yeah. uh, a, a, an approach, a liberal political approach and a, you know, just a, a justice-oriented approach to Judaism have just sort of gone together. Um, I think among the Orthodox, that's you know somewhat less true in terms of the, their political uh, political views. Um, but I think also their understanding is much more. Um, I would suspect. Uh, I w and the word that I'm coming up with is something like granular, as opposed to fitting you know, the soup kitchen work and the, and the letter writing and the tzedaka all under the same rubric, they would understand those as different. You know, tzedaka is its own mitzvah and its own, its own domain. And, you know, um, you know, acting to feed uh, people who are hungry or in need of, in need of food or shelter or clothing or whatever it is, is, you know, fits under the rubric of, of mitzvah. And in that way, you know, those are different mitzvot all part of the same effort of doing mitzvot, but without the sort of overall umbrella term. Um, yeah, and general Orthodox Jews don't talk about tikkun olam the way most predominantly Reformed Jews do. In my, in my experience, in my experience anyway, yeah. yeah. I'm wondering if um, that has something to do with the fact that at least in, in the original Tukun Olam source you presented, the Elenu, mm, yeah. it specifically says that the person, mm -hmm. quote unquote, who's going to be doing Tukun Olam is, is, is God. It's yeah. Specific. Right. So it says you will perfect the world by your sovereignty. And it makes it sound as if it's not, I don't know. I'm just throwing that out. Yeah. I have no idea. But I think I'm that's, also, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, I think that's entirely possible. And, and Rabbi Green notes that too in his book that, you know, in, in one of the earlier senses, this, we didn't even have, we don't even have anything to do with this kind of tikkun olam, right? This is, this is God's tikkun, right? Right. Right. Uh, okay. so I think you're, you're onto something there, yeah. I also think it, I mean, you might, if you, for, if you're Chabad, for example, for you tikkun olam might be getting someone to lay tefillin or light Shabbat candles on Friday night. Mm. You know, that, that might be tikkun olam. For you is getting Jews to be more observant. Again, I don't know, but it seems yeah. to be possible I mean, that different people are going to have different um, 
ideas of what it takes to perfect the world and bring right. it under God's dominion. Right. So. Yeah, I wonder. I, I, that's a that's a worthwhile question to ask next time we, you know, one of us bumps into a Chabadnik. Um, it, would they understand something like that as as part of tikkun olam? I don't actually know how how present that that idea is in their thinking. That's a good question. Thanks, Rachel. I'm wondering because my view of tikkun olam, which was similar to yours, was pretty much cultivated in a conservative, mostly in Jewish summer camp um, <laughs> venue, and I don't know a ton about Orthodox theology, but I know it tends to have a more infallible view of God. So if you take a more prepared, a humans repairing the world approach to Tikkun Olam, I wonder if that could be in Orthodox circles or Orthodox theology, you know, more in yeah. conflict with the idea that if God made the world, does it need to be repaired? Um, well, yeah. actually, that's a, you set me up really nicely, Amy, for a, transa- a transition, transition into uh, the next, my next idea, um, with that idea of like, is there, is there still work to do? Um, and I would note, like, Orthodoxy is not monolithic, and there are a lot. There are Hasidic Orthodox Jews and non-Hasidic Orthodox Jews, and lots of variations among there too. So, I think you know we can try to kind of generalize, but we're not going to succeed very, very effectively, regardless. Um, but it's towards you know developing an idea of how you know how I think we maybe should deploy the term tikkun olam effectively. Um, these are some texts actually that Rabbi, Rabbi Green brings, and I, I wanted to reduplicate them here partially just to, to you know, elucidate them for you. But because one of the things Rabbi Green talks about is the way that, that Tikkun Olam expresses this idea of a, a divine human partnership and, and how important that is. And I think that's, that ought to be the fo- our focus, our ultimately our goal in deploying the term tikkun olam, is to r- situate our work in the world within a divine human partnership. So Rabbi Green takes a few of these texts, uh, also from from the creation story. For example, in source number eight here, the third verse of Genesis chapter two: God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, because on it, God ceased from all the work of creation that God had done. Now it doesn't read you know, the, the text is kind of correct, corrected, or the translation is kind of corrected some of the awkwardness of the Hebrew here. But an important, uh, basically important drash on this verse takes, a, takes the Hebrew over literally, such that, uh, on it, God ceased from all God's labor that God created to do. In other words, God created the world in order for there to be an ex- basically this la asot is somewhat superfluous in the hebrew but we read we read meaning into that rather than just assuming it's superfluous to take this as as saying that god ceased from all the work of creation um and there was still more to do god created the world in order for us to la asot this 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 verb at the end that means to do refers to us and the work for us to do um, that it's, you know, at the point of God's resting, the world was somehow still incomplete. There's, there's an essential human task uh, left to us in order to do, and we're somehow required to, to fill creation's purpose. Part, part of our purpose is to complete that work of creation. And Rabbi Green brings this verse as well, that, that God took the, the Adam, the human, and placed, uh, placed that first human in the garden, in the Garden of Eden, Le'ovda ulishomra, to till it and tend it, or to, to work it and guard it, something along those lines. Speaking to our purpose, you know, again, the, an essential sense of human life is fulfilling a divine command. You know, we, we are here with a job to do in the world. Our purpose is somehow to till and tend it or work it and guard it, whatever, however you want to read those lines or those words. Um, and finally... Rabbi Green brings this line. The Lord, Lord God called out to the man and said, Ayeka, where are you? And this is this line, Ayeka, this sort of God question, you know, asking the question, where are you? Speaking to humans has been a focal point of not only Rabbi Green's theology, but Abraham Joshua Hessel's, you know, God in search of man. Um, 
this has been really a, a you know, a, a, a very significant question. Um, Rabbi Green reads this as a call, not just at that one place to that one early human, but as a call to all human generations. Asking, I, I quoted this line here, you know, where are you in fulfilling the best of your evolutionary legacy? Where are you in being human in the fullest sense of that word, bearing within you the image of the divine? Are you living and acting that way? The universe needs you to do so. So to tie it back to what you brought up, Amy, the idea that, you know, isn't it a little presumptuous to say, you know, that God somehow created the world, you know, imperfectly? Well, that drosh, you know, that idea actually goes way back, you know, to, to understanding of, of these, early, uh, these early verses in Genesis, that somehow it's not that God, you know, made a mistake in creating that way. That's for Shalom, we would never say that. But God somehow on purpose created, created the world with work for us to do. God somehow needs us. We're, we're designed and, and created explicitly to be God's partners. Now, I think the notion that we're here to do God's work, essentially, is, is essential to Judaism. And it's, it's, it's really compelling. It's, it's an extension, you know, to tie it back to something we talked about last week. It's an extension, I think, of that idea of imitatio dei, you know, uh, imitating God in terms of we ought to behave with the same attributes that God does. You know, it's, but it's not, just imi- it's not just imitating. It's actually almost doing God's work for God right? We're, we're, you know, God brought us this far. We need to somehow carry the, carry the ball across the goal line. Um, it's our, it's our task to fix the broken world that was, that was, you know, deliberately created broken in order to get it ready for the messianic era to come, right? And I think it's, it's very powerful. You know, Kaylee spoke to the way, you know, it, it, uh, it served as a, a motivating force, right? And I got to say, it was for, formational for me as well. Um, there's something really compelling about feeling like what you do in the world is part of a, a much larger system. It's not just fixing small problems, right? It's actually contribute to something, uh, you know, some sort of overall, you know, total repair of the world. That has a, you know, I, I think there's a reason this, ter- this term has been used so much and it's hung around and become so ubiquitous. Is because that's really compelling to people. It 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 gives you the sense of being something bigger than yourself and bigger than just you know whatever problem you're working on. Especially because so many of the problems we work on are so so intractable and it's hard to to see or measure uh, you know real change in them just by virtue of the work that we do. So in thinking about how to how we might deploy tikkun olam going you know going forward. Um, and this is really, you know, the conclusion of, of Rabbi Jill Jacobs' article as well, and I'm very much in agreement with her. She suggests a reimagining of tikkun olam that basically combines those four understandings that we talked about already um, in traditional text into a, um, a more complete, a more kind of three-dimensional vision of tikkun olam as opposed to just, you know, social justice or just liberal politics. Um, Rabbi Jill Jacobs says, you know, from the Elenu conception, the idea of, you know, uh, divine per- uh, perfection of the world under divine sovereignty, our sort of three-dimensional uh, understanding of Tikkun Olam will include an emphasis on the elimination of evil and the restoration of the world to a perfected divine state. From that Midrashic uh, idea of literally, you know, Tikkun Olam is physical stabilization of the universe itself. Uh, it reminds us of the need to work to preserve the world at a time when human behavior is having a negative impact on global temperatures, hurricane systems, other natural phenomenon. We are, we are the stabilizing force for, for, the, for the world. From the rabbinic understanding of tikkun olam as uh, creation of a workable social and religious system, that leads to a definition of tikkun olam as basically a mandate to correct the systems that make our own society dysfunctional. You know, I think it's real, really easy to locate um, work for racial justice, which is, you know, suddenly at the forefront of our, our concern within 
that kind of framework, uh, that that Tikkun Olam framework. You know, we need the system to to function as it's intended to, you know, as it's intended to function, and not, um, uh, you know, even though you know some some of the some of the uh, the racism that's ex expressed in our in our country is completely legal. We need to affect Tikkun Olam to make sure that despite its legality, it, it doesn't doesn't happen. And finally, the Lurianic belief uh, that individual actions can have a permanent effect on the cosmos, you know, the idea of lifting up these sparks and actually, you know, somehow affecting the world through our performance of mitzvah, offers really the hope that our efforts toward tikkun will somehow, somehow succeed. So by combining the, the major themes of these, these four strands, we come to a definition of tikkun olam as basically the process of fixing large societal problems. And that's really how I like to deploy it. I, uh, you know, I, um, our topic, our, our study theme for the year with the Beit Midrash, with the religious school at, at, at Beit Am this year, was all about derech eretz, you know, basically Jewish values and, you know, to some extent mitzvot, but I deliberately shied away from calling it all tikkun olam. And, but I did teach specifically that when we talk about tikkun olam, I think we're, we're talking about fixing the, the big systemic societal problems. And by using it specifically to talk about that work, we prevent it from getting diluted such, such that, you know, everything kind of falls under the same umbrella, but we maintain that kind of potency, right? The, the inspiring potency, because that's, it's the big societal problems where you really need the hope, where you really need the sense that this is part of something bigger because it's so hard to see the progress, right? And so that's my proposal, personally, for how, how we might use tikkun olam most effectively, really, um, to refer specifically to fixing these large societal problems. And, um, you know, while maintaining a belief that our actions can have a, a positive effect on the greater, not only the greater human world, but also the greater divine world. Okay, that's the end of what I prepared today. Are there any questions, comments, reactions? Anything you have to share, I would love to hear it. Thank you all so much for learning with me today, of course. Wonderful, wonderful to see you all. What do you think? You're quiet today. Uh, Amy asks, where does our own personal work fall within this framework? Hmm. Can you be more specific, Amy, about what you mean by personal work? You mean sort of like internal spiritual work? Ah, okay. Interesting. Um, hmm. I think... I mean, one of the, I mean, hmm. I think Chikuna, like the sort of personal spiritual work makes sense within the, um, or sort of understanding personal spiritual growth as Chikuna Lama makes sense within that Lurianic idea, right? Of, of lifting up divine sparks, because just as there's sparks in all the stuff around me, there's sparks within me too that need to be uh, first discovered and then lifted up. So I think it's easy, it's easy for me to see that particular understanding of Tikkun Olam as relating to, you know, personal spiritual growth and development. Um, you know, the others, I think because they're so, you know, the, the sort of Tikkun Olam is divine sovereignty that doesn't seem to re directly relate. And the other ones are so interpersonal you know, they have to do with, you know, society at, at large. Um, it's harder for me to see that. But I think within, um, within the, the sort of Lurianic idea of locating um, sparks of divine emanation and lifting them up, I think it's, it's definitely possible to locate, you know, sort of sp personal spiritual development within the framework of Tikkun Olam in that, in that sense. Does that kind of make sense? I'm curious. I mean, if if you if you have other ideas, I'm open to hear that. I haven't actually considered that question yet. Um, 
I would say we need to, I mean, you need to work on both yourself. You need to work on yourself and hopefully try to make the world better for other people besides yourself. Mm. Sort of like if I'm not uh, for myself, you know, who will be, but if I'm only for myself, who am I or something to that effect is what one of our rabbis said, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Ra uh, Rabbi Hillel did say that. <laughs> yeah. I, actually, I could, I could see that. Actually, over here, I can, if I go back to, you know, things, things like, um, you know, if, if we are the, the forces that are the physical stabilizers of the world, maybe working on ourselves to uh, improve our understanding of the, the way the, the actions we take, you know, work for or against that. I could, I could see it, you know, so for example, um, you know, the more I learn about how to, I don't know, recycle and reuse effectively and things of that nature, you know, that's personal, that's personal growth, but towards this, you know, tikkun olam in this sense, as a, as a sustaining, stabilizing force in the world. I think that's totally possible. Keely says, the message I'm receiving today from a variety of sources is the alternation between looking at the large and the small. I'm going to look, I have to look to the world to know where I'm going, and I have to look at what's right in front of me to find what I can actually do, to make progress, to take action. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, and Amy says, yes, by working on oneself, we heal confusion, hurts, we, yes. So that's sort of always the, the, the tension, right? Like, it's, it's very difficult to focus on the, you know, the sort of big picture stuff. Um, or if you are focusing out there, you know, to focus on, on the, the, the very personal, either within yourself or within your immediate relations to other people. Um, you know, but they're, they're clearly interconnected, right? Um, in order to, in order to understand how you're affecting the, 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 the world more broadly, it might uh, be beneficial to, to, to focus on your, yourself and your immediate relationships first. Um, and I think probably vice versa as well. Yeah. Good, Kaylee. Thanks. Any other thoughts or comments, anything along those lines about about tikkun olam? I think Deborah. it has to do with Please. consciousness as well. Yeah. That as we become more conscious, that we're trying to evolve as more um, holy or sacred containers for this. And that there's something within us, I believe, that is driven toward doing that. Mm. So I like the idea of the large and the small, but I think also simultaneously or as it happens. Hmm. Does that make sense? Sounds like large and small. Oh, yes. I mean, I think that's the reality. It's difficult to to sort of concentrate on them all at once. Like we usually are concentrating on small or large, but the reality is they're all happening all the time simultaneously. Exactly. Right. So it's not a question of working on yourself, as I think everybody knows here, but knowing that it's all part of an elevation that we came here to do. And the more that we're refining ourselves, uh, the more effective in the larger sense we're able to be in the mechanism of tikkun olam. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. And thank you, everyone. This has been really wonderful learning with you this afternoon.